Hey everybody, Jordan with Farm Builder and coming to you today in a time when we as an agricultural community are going through some unprecedented, unimagined uh, crisis that is devastating to a lot of farmers. Um, a lot of news happening this week of hog farms going through mass depopulations, uh, chicken farms being gassed and millions of birds being killed uh, because of a collapsing processing industry. The plants simply aren't able to process through the animals as they have been operating at max capacity with labor issues before any of this current crisis broke out and now the animals are just stacking up in the pipeline. Today I was able to talk with Congressman Thomas Massey who has for years been one of the people talking about a decentralized more localized processing system. He has a piece of legislation called the Prime Act and we'll be reintroducing that to Congress soon. So I had an opportunity today to interview him and to ask some of the questions, um, both from the community of farmers and eaters about this bill. So I hope you all enjoy it. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Um, we've been really busy on our farm the last couple months, and so that's kind of limited the posting, but had an amazing opportunity this afternoon to jump on with Congressman Thomas Massey out of Kentucky. And for some of you guys who are in the direct to retail small farm game, you know who he is and what he's been trying to do with the Prime Act. But for a lot of you, maybe this is the first time you've heard about him other than the president's recent tweets uh, about stimulus <laughs> bills and things like that. But we're not talking about that today. We're talking about farm stuff. Um, so Congressman, thanks for being here and appreciate you cutting out some time for me. Well, thanks for having me on, Jordan. Yeah, I'm here in Kentucky. I'm raring to go back to DC and, and get more co-sponsors for my Prime Act, but um, this is my farm here behind me. We raise cattle on my farm, been doing that for about 16 years. And uh, because we try to direct market those ourselves, we're familiar with some of the struggles and hurdles that farmers run into when they sell to consumers. So, you know, five years ago when I got to Congress, well, I got to Congress eight years ago, but five years ago, I decided to introduce a bill to help farmers, not just cattle farmers, but lamb and pork as well, to make it easier to use local processors to sell food directly to local consumers. And I called that bill the Prime Act. And everything in Washington, D.C. is usually some ridiculous acronym. So I was compelled to come up with an acronym for my bill and PRIME stands for Processing Revival and Interstate Meat Exemption. So, you know, Processing Revival, you know, five years ago, nobody knew that our processors needed to be revived. But here we are today, and there's shortages in the supermarket. And that's not the fault of the farmers, and that's not the fault of the supermarket. It's the, the problem is that four processing companies process 80% of the beef and pork in this country and they're shutting down. And, the, and so we need a revival in processing. And my bill would allow that. It would, give, it would expand the exemption, the USDA exemption that exists for these custom slaughterhouses to allow them to sell individual cuts of meat and individual packages and allow them to sell in their grocery stores as long as they qualify um, in two ways. Number one, they have to be in compliance with their state laws and their local health departments, because that's how a lot of them are already regulated. Uh, it, so they, they have to do that. And they also have to sell within their state. So this is sort of the constitutional hook for my bill. I realized, look, if a farmer in a state wants to sell to a consumer in a state and they use a grocery store and a processor in that state, what nexus does the federal government have? And they have no nexus if it's all intrastate commerce. And so that's the premise behind my bill. I've got almost 40 co-sponsors in the house now. I've picked up a dozen this week. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to come on your show and, um, and tell people and motivate them to call their congressman. <laughs> the phone calls have caused 12 congressmen to join my bill in the last week. And it doesn't take thousands of phone calls. It only takes a few dozen to each congressman to get them as co-sponsors on a bill. So call your, call your congressman. And by the way, Jordan, um, don't call Nancy Pelosi and don't call Mitch McConnell unless they're actually they're your representatives. 
uh, call the one U.S. representative that you have, you only have one, and call the two U.S. senators that you have. You have two of those. Every, every state has two senators. Those are only three phone calls you need to make. You can do this in about 15 minutes. It might take five minutes per phone call. Be polite, be short, let them know there's a problem with the meat supply. There's a, there's a solution that's healthy and safe and it puts America first. Um, and uh, well, that might not work on some of the senators and representatives, but <laughs> tell them it's a good idea and be polite and don't stay on the phone too long. Yeah, it's, you know, for those of us in the farming community, um, you know, I can talk to old timers around me that used to have the little community butcher shops or there's still the, the cinder block building there that they were doing processing at every year. Um, and some of them were experienced as, as young men and women working in those facilities. But you know, a lot of that has, has just fallen away as you know, regulatory uh, issues and then just market competitive uh, aspects slowly push these small uh, small scale processors out of the way and you know, regulation squeezed them and then the economies of scale that these bigger guys had kind of crushed them out on the, the economic side. Uh, but I think you know, we're talking here on May 6th and you know, we have uh, 15, 20% of you know, large red meat plants offline right now, you know, upwards of 50% of pork not being processed and you know, this, this uh, tragedy that we're reading about of, you know, depopulations going on on these hog farms and poultry houses being gas. And so what we're seeing is, in, in my opinion, the, the uh, kind of soft underbelly of a very efficient industry that has been built up over the last 80 years, but it has this extremely um, fragile element to it that once one domino falls, they just start stacking up so fast that almost by the hour, the problem is spinning out of hand um, all the way back to, you know, it's now affecting uh, even farrowing farms that are doing piglets and it's going to stack up to grain bins behind that that are going to be too full to put crops in this fall. Um, so, you know, America has done a, an exceptional job at scaling agriculture but is that necessary? The way we've done it has exposed a, uh, I would say, a, an inherent weakness to that system. And one of the things I like about what the, the Prime Act is uh, proposing is that it would allow a lot of these custom shops that are around us still that do a lot of deer in the fall or they do, you know, a beef or two a week and it's some old timers in there. It might free up some of the regulatory constraints. Um, that would allow them to breathe some new life into their facility and maybe begin to to revitalize this small scale processing. Um, do you see though, I, I had some, some questions from uh, a big face group that we run that's a lot of farmers in there. And if you don't mind, we'll go through some of those questions here. Yeah, I'll that'd be great. Um, you know, it, it seems that there, there's a lot of wind behind these sales right now to affect a, a legislative change. Um, do you think, though, that is going to bring immediate relief to the problem that folks are seeing at the grocery store, you know, right now? Well, um, the reality is a lot of these custom shops are also backed up because when, when the farmers saw the price of their calves drop to, to nothing, um, they said, you know what, I can take it to a local processor and sell it as a half or a quarter. And also when there's shortages in the, in the supermarket, uh, people are looking at buying a half or a quarter of an animal. But then now you have a shortage of freezers. Literally, go, go try to buy a deep chest freezer right now and you'll, you'll be surprised. Um, good luck if you can find one. So the question is, does it provide immediate relief? I think it does because most of these uh, processing shops, the local ones, they could hire uh, a few more people and they could process more, but they're, and they, and some of them have equipment that's just sitting in the corner that they're not using. I know where there's equipment sitting where processors just went out of business and they're sitting in barns somewhere. And I've had people tell me, that if you get this bill passed, I'll be up and running again in five weeks. Like, you know, the, the value of their equipment was nothing when they went out of business. So they just kept the equipment and some of these places still have the facilities. They could open back up in five weeks. And that's why the bill needs to be permanent law, not temporary. 
the entrepreneurs are not going to invest in equipment or rent or space or even the trouble of, of hiring people if they know it goes away in six months. They, if they're going to make that investment, it needs to be a change to permanent law. It shouldn't be an executive order by the president or some change at the USDA, some temporary relief, because that won't really solve the problem. The, the uh, entrepreneurs won't be able to make long-term investments. But if this bill does pass, I've been told by people that own processing shops that could expand their processing, and by people who own processing shops and shut down and still have their equipment, but would gladly get back into it, that they could come online with more capacity very quickly. By the way, you can tell the age of, of somebody by what they call these facilities, where they're slaughterhouses or whatever. Someone called it a locker plant the other yeah. day. Yeah. And uh, my grandfather owned a locker plant and he used to sell ice. This was before refrigerators, before everybody had a refrigerator you would go down and rent locker space in a big giant freezer and you could keep your produce there that you grew on your farm. But my, my grandfather would butcher animals for people right there at the locker plant and then they could put it right in their locker. Yeah. So uh, anyways, yeah, we need to get back to what we were doing. It, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to keep a farmer from, from destroying, you know, 10,000 slaughter ready hogs tomorrow, which is probably going to happen tomorrow. Um, but it will start to feather in and it will start to solve the problem. And I believe entrepreneurs will respond. Yeah, it's, it's certainly been a issue of uh, a lot of discussion in the, the red meat direct to retail farms like we have and um, you know, guys like White Oak Pastures have and Greg Gumthrope and Polyface and so on of this capacity of, of uh, being able to process and the expense um, that's there. And, you know, maybe what a lot of people don't know is even a USDA inspected facility can only operate for eight hours a day. Um, they can only be, you know, uh, harvesting the animals or cutting them up while the inspector is present. Um, and then it costs hundreds of dollars an hour if they're going to go beyond that to like a second shift or having to keep, keep them later. Um, you kind of answered mm -hmm. my, my next question a little bit there, but do you think it would be a good idea for some kind of executive action where, you know, at these existing USDA plants, um, you know, maybe have some kind of limit on, uh, you know, what scale and below would be eligible for this. But do you think there that would be a good idea to have some kind of suspension of USDA um, inspector presence for a period of time to get through this backlog? Because like our processor that we use, they're booking 2021 right now. Um, you, you, you're not getting anything in right now. It doesn't matter how much money you try to throw at them. Right. I spoke with the undersecretary for food safety at the USDA uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she denied there was even a problem. Uh, my, you know, my first thought was, yeah, Congress moves slowly. Let's get some relief at the USDA. Let's get them to do something. Right. Now, they are trying to uh, move, you know, when, when an inspector – it can't work at a facility because it's shut down. They're trying to reassign that inspector to another facility. And um, they assured me that they've got enough inspectors to get everywhere. They don't need to suspend inspection at USDA facilities. They assure me that they've got plenty of inspectors. Now, I, I don't know if that's true or not. I can't verify it. Maybe some of your listeners can. I can tell you that um, I took two steers to a USDA facility uh, last week. Yeah. Hauled them myself. And um, they are now booked. I made that appointment in January and they took my beef and in, in, or my beefs in uh, April. I tried to book another slot. They said they're backed up until August and they're not putting anybody on the calendar now. Yeah. They won't, they won't receive you. By the way, um, the reason I think this is important, whether it's a suspension at the USDA uh, for, for custom slaughterhouses that don't have inspections current, or full-time inspections, I mean, they're all inspected to some degree, is that a, a lot of people are going without a salary and they don't have a lot of money. And to tell them, we'll go contract with a farmer and buy a quarter of an animal, they don't have $500 or $600 to pay 
for a quarter of an animal and they don't have the freezer space. So yeah. I do think they're for the lower income and the middle income folks, this needs to be a, a solution that's offered now. What they are more likely to do, and this bothers me, is they're more likely to import beef from overseas to fill in the gaps. And um, they got rid of country of origin labeling for beef and pork in 2015. Now I fought that. Uh, you know, I thought we should be able to know, like supermarket goers should be able to know where their beef came from. If 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 the uh, fish is labeled and the fruits are labeled, and if your iPhone and your clothes are labeled, shouldn't your beef and pork have a label on it? And yeah. they disagreed with me and they passed it anyway. But now they're set up to import all this beef, slap a USDA sticker on it, and say, and people will think they're eating USA sourced beef. Yeah, that, that's correct from my understanding that as long as the, is the meat comes in as a carcass and is broken down in the States, it can even have a product of USA label on it. And so you're buying a, uh, you know, more than likely a, a T-bone or a sirloin somewhere and it's coming from, you know, Nambia, I think was the one that yeah. I saw the other day where, you know, we're, uh, we have uh, feedlots out West that are looking at having to depopulate cattle, which, you know, is, is just mind blowing. And we're receiving shipments of meat from other countries. Um, it's, it is. <laughs> it's a real tangled web. <laughs> By the way, Jordan, you know, I'm a farmer and I, and I, I suspect most of your listeners are farmers. If I lose a calf and, and this has happened, you know, animals, everything doesn't go the way you'd hope it would. If I go out and find that a calf has died, the first thing that goes through my mind is sympathy for the animal. Like what could I've done? What could I've done better as a farmer to, to prevent suffering or this unneeded waste? It's only like an hour or two until it occurs to me, I just lost $500 or $1,000 on my farm, right? Yep. And so when people see these animals being wasted, I think um, it's, it's, it's coming home. They're, they're understanding why it's important to get this bill passed because we couldn't prevent all of the wasting that's happening now, but we could uh, make our food processing more robust and less brittle so that this doesn't happen in the future. And there, it will provide some temporary relief. Yeah. Um, so a couple of just nuts and bolts details about the bill um, that's geared more towards answering questions from producers. Um, so the bill, as it's proposed right now, would essentially allow by the piece sale of custom inspected meat inside of the state of origin. It yes. Is, correct. Cu Okay. Custom meat uh, slaughtered, it would, and it would be a facility that doesn't have a USDA inspector full time. Okay, so uh, it would allow anything from a USDA, or, you know, a current USDA facility to a state inspected to a custom exempt facility. And I know once you get out of the USDA level inspection, each state is different. And yeah, you know, I'm sure as right. you're aware, with uh, especially like on poultry with the PL 9492, it, it's just all over the place depending on which state. But this essentially would allow anyone who has a custom or an exempted facility or a state inspected facility um, to sell. To, you know, me as a farmer or you as a farmer um, can take the animals there. Um, you know, for red meat, I assume this is what it's applying to. And it's for, we it's can for now, beef, beef, pork, or lamb. Got it. And it's, then um, we can sell those cuts by the piece. That's correct. And, and you're right. Every state is different. Some states uh, d don't have a state inspection program. But let me tell you how it works here in Kentucky, three miles from, from my farm right here. Um, I use a custom slaughterhouse. And um, he tells me that he's inspected by the county health department. And so he, you know, just like a restaurant would be inspected, he's inspected by the health department. He's also subject to surprise inspections by the USDA. He says, you know, he was just going about his business one day and the USDA stopped in and um, he had no, nothing to hide. So he showed him around, but the, he's subject to surprise inspections by the USDA. So um, some states have a third layer, which would be a state inspection. And I know, for instance, in Utah, they, the state ag department and the USDA sort of came to an agreement where they're offering 10, uh, up to 10 processors who aren't currently inspected could 
fall under the state inspection program in lieu of the USDA inspection program. Now, I don't know if they've had any processors take them up on that yet, because it may be that the state inspection is as onerous as the USDA inspection rules, and it may be that they couldn't comply with that. But, you know, I'm maintaining that all of the facilities that I've used, I've used four different facilities here in Kentucky to have my beef processed. One is USDA and, and three are not. By the way, I saw dairy cattle at the USDA facility for the first time ever. Mm-hmm. It's sort of an intermediate facility. It's not a giant processor. It's, it's almost like a custom shop, but they're big enough to uh, comply with USDA. Now it's more expensive. But normally you wouldn't use a place like that to have dairy cattle butchered, but they, they're being butchered there now. And that's adding to the uh, clog in the pipeline for beef producers. But of the three that aren't USDA inspected that I have used here in Kentucky that are near my farm, I've never heard of anybody ever getting sick from eating beef at any of those facilities. And I would maintain that it's safer because the consumers, when you, when you go to pick up your beef, they let you walk in the back. You can look in the back at what they're doing. And also they're not commingling, uh, you, you know, a thousand animals that day. Right. You know, it's, it may be a dozen animals that are being butchered that day. Yeah. One of the biggest concerns with red meat processing is, um, you know, the commingling of trim that you have a facility that's doing a hundred thousand pounds of ground beef, um, you know, per day. And, uh, you know, I think the number is something like any given hamburger you eat at a fast food place uh, is most likely composed of 600 different cows or something like mm-hmm. that. And, um, yeah, like I've said for a long time, you never see a food borne illness epidemic starting at a farmer's market or at a small facility. Um, you know, not that they never have problems, but when they do, it's contained very small and very fast. Right. So that's, I mean, and, and that's a concern. That's a valid concern for consumers is, is this safe? And you could, I mean, nobody gets to slap a USDA inspected label on that and sell it in the supermarket. I mean, they can sell it in the supermarket, but what I think is it should be labeled with the farm and the processor. And then now you've got something that's not even fathomable in the current food supply. You can actually know every uh, link in the chain that uh, led from the food getting to your table. Correct. Yeah, it starts to build accountability. Um, you have no idea as a consumer unless you know how to read a USDA stamp, you know, even what facility it was done in, let alone what farm it came from. You're, you're never going to know that. But Right. Um, so I had some, some rapid fire questions here and I wanted to yeah. respect the time that you okay, had. Okay, Jeopardy and, round. That's right. Um, and these are coming from the, the community of farmers that we have online. Um, so the first one would be, uh, does this affect poultry exemptions that already exist in most states? No, my bill doesn't deal with poultry at all. I know there's a, an existing exemption at the federal level. Um, I, I've never sold any poultry off my farm. Like I say, we process our own just for, uh, for ourselves and family. Um, but it does not deal with poultry. Right. And for our Audience, you can look up a law, it's uh, public law, uh, PL 9492, and that deals with the USDA exemption of up to 20,000 birds. It depends on your state. Like here in Virginia, we are inspected by the state one time on an exempted facility, and we can do 20,000 birds a year. But I know you go 25 minutes west into one, uh, West Virginia, it's a 1,000 bird ca- hard cap, and you got to go to the USDA after that. Um, oh, and, and next- while, while you're on that point, it yeah. doesn't change any state laws either. The, okay. the Prime Act is only for the federal inspection exemption. That's good to know. Would there be, um, I assume most states would layer in some additional regulation at some point on this for these custom facilities? They can, but my bill is silent on that. Um, other than you, you still have to comply with any state and local laws. So basically the, the regime that would apply uh, in your state would be the regime that applies to custom slaughterhouses right now. However, they are regulated at this time, that's how they would be regulated uh, if they sold it by the cut, as long as they stay within the state in terms of the transaction. Now, the kind of- state, state legislatures could layer on another level in there if they want. Gotcha. 
Um, so a couple questions here just on, on the food safety. I assume the answer is going to be this is given to the states. Um, you know, how imaginative something that's in our constitution actually being mentioned. Um, but it's talking about food safety, um, humane slaughter, kind of these things that the USDA is uh, responsible for administrating, um, you know, uh, recall type of protocols. How would that work um, if the Prime Act were to pass and be implemented? What are your thoughts on those type of mechanisms being in place for these now uh, custom facilities? So um, I have one colleague who made a suggestion. And by the, will, by the way, I'm willing to amend the bill. I know there are organizations that have concerns. And so one of my colleagues made a suggestion that a veterinarian, you know, your local veterinarian uh, should witness the, or at least see the animals as they come in alive. Um, and that that would be another layer that you could apply in the state if you wanted. I would also be okay and it, it might not be a bad idea to have a video camera there and to video the, the kill of every animal, you know, that's probably something they don't even do in the USDA facilities right now. It's just up to one person's word. And that can, that can either uh, be to the benefit or the detriment of, sure. of the processing plant, but I'd be okay. Put a camera there and you know what, do a live feed. If, you know, if one USDA inspector can inspect the facility, that's butchering a thousand animals a day, then why can't one USDA inspector monitor uh, the feed, the video feed from 10 small places? And uh, so right. there are numerous ways. If you're worried about the, uh, basically the welfare of the animal during the kill or the condition, the health condition of the animal, then um, film it and keep a record. I would think, actually I would think that individual the slaughterhouses would would want to do that in terms of to insulate them from liability. But ultimately, you know, the chain of responsibility is there. If you get bad meat, you know the processor and you know the farmer. Yeah, I agree that um, there's a lot of things, but this in particular is due for a technological upgrade. Yeah, um, you know, we're seeing the the decentralization of a lot of things occurring in you know the. Uh, the, the kind of dissolving of brick and mortar institutions. You know, we're seeing that with schooling right now that everyone's kids are homeschooled right now. Um, who, who would have thought that last year? But you know, um, every, everybody can do everything <laughs> online now, except for Congress. We still haven't figured out how to have a committee hearing or even so, so much as a committee vote uh, remotely. <laughs> it's, well, you know, we've got all these kids. Government. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So last, last question for you here. And, um, this one's kind of making me chuckle, but it was asked several times. Um, <laughs> it's it's uh, kind of revolving around uh, where is the resistance for this coming from and uh, what are their motivations? That's a great question because if I'm gonna get this bill passed, we have to overcome the resistance. And uh, let me first tell you that our resistance needs to be bigger than their resistance, okay? So it's good to ask who is the enemy but, but ultimately, remember this fact, uh, politicians want to get reelected and they are going to respond to the squeakiest wheel. And in the last week, I've picked up a dozen co-sponsors merely because people made phone calls. Now, why weren't those people co-sponsors already? It's because there are lobbyists in Washington, DC. I know that's a shocker. Uh, but the, and the lobbyists write checks, the lobbyists uh, host fundraisers and invite other lobbyists to come over and donate at the fundraisers. By the way, the, uh, the U.S. Cattlemen's Association was going to do a fundraiser for me the first year I got to Congress. I was, they were going to let me use their facility there in Washington, D.C. And uh, we had everybody invited and I voted against the farm bill and they called you? me up. Within, within 30 minutes, they called me up and said, don't bother showing up, cancel the fundraiser. We're not gonna help out Congressman Massey. And they, and they haven't done anything for me since then, but they have fought on a lot of issues that are important to farmers. Now, the funny thing is they use uh, cattlemen in the name of their organization. But most, most of what they promote in Washington, D.C. is counter to what the cattlemen here in Kentucky want. So, that's, that's one thing that's, that you have going on. Sometimes you get uh, conflicts among farmers, like the corn growers may not have the same interests 
as the, uh, you know, cow-calf operations, right? Because um, if you can turn corn into protein, uh, your costs involve the price of the calf. So the corn growers may want to see cheap calves. And so you have a little bit of a conflict there. The reason I'm telling you that is you have other organizations like Farm Bureau, okay, who uh, represent a wide array of farmers and farms. And um, frankly, Farm Bureau, they're not really against my bill, but they're not for it. And they need to be for it because most of their members are, would be for it, um, except maybe they've come up with a reason why it's not good for the corn growers. I don't know. I don't, I don't believe that. I think it's good for everybody, but maybe they've come up with a reason. When I talked to the USDA about the Prime Act, one of the, uh, one of the objections they expressed is the World Trade Organization and the USTR would not approve of the Prime Act. <laughs> Uh, they said because we have um, strict regulations on the meat that's imported and that if we reduce any regulation on our own producers, that, that might be considered an unfair uh, trade practice. And it could, and, you know, they would touch off a trade war, for instance, or some lawsuits in the, in the World Trade Organization. And then also you have... Um, people that bureaucrats have been at the USDA for decades and um, their power derives from these regulations and they don't want to give any of that up. So just to go back through the list <laughs> of uh, people that oppose this, you've got the farm organizations in Washington DC that are supposed to be for farmers and sometimes they get on the other side of these issues um, and it's hard for me to say that they're actually for farmers. But if you belong to one of those organizations, call them up and tell them, we need you to throw your support behind this bill instead of staying on the sidelines or quietly undermining it. Um, that's one thing you should do. And then um, call, your, call your legislator. Look, they've got all these other people talking in their ear. They've got the farm groups. They've got the multinational corporations. They've got the bureaucrats at the USDA. Maybe they hired a staffer for, to do their farm policy and they hired a staffer from the USDA because they were knowledgeable about you've got this revolving door between staff and lobbyists and and, uh, and USDA staff but ultimately at the end of the day politicians are going to respond to people that elect them and that's why I'm saying when you call a politician only call the ones you can vote for and and don't don't say, you know what, I call them about the gun issue, I call them about the abortion issue, and they're never on my side, so I'm not calling them again. Well, this is not a partisan issue. There are seven Democrat co-sponsors on this bill in the House. The, the, the main leading sponsor in the Senate is Angus King. He's an independent who caucuses with Democrats. And then the, the balance of them are Republican members of Congress. So do, even if you've given up on your two senators and your U.S. representative, don't give up on this issue. They may be on the fence, uh, to use a farm analogy, <laughs> and, um, and they're being buffaloed by the lobbyists. So get, get out your cattle prod and use it on them. <laughs> it, we may need to, uh, to have a, a march with the cattle prods. That's an excellent idea. Um, yeah, those of us who, who have paid attention to this are well aware of the revolving door between big industry, the lobby interests in the USDA. Um, you know, we only need to look at the, uh, the last um, uh, secretary of the USDA and where he's working now once he left uh, the administration uh, to see this, this door that uh, you know, it's industry interests and uh, it's the USDA shoveling them money. And you know, if you think about it, if, if you own a business where you set the price of the wholesale goods, the raw material that you're purchasing, and then you set the price of the product you're selling out the other door. Um, that's a very uh, profitable place to be, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of motivation to preserve that that type of structure. And I think we certainly see that um, in this situation. And it's unfortunate because I, if there's one topic I think every uh, American could agree on, it should be the accessibility uh, to the food that you want to eat, where you want to eat it, and being able to buy directly from the farm. 
Um, it, it seems uh, so obvious to many of us, but um, it's something that <laughs> um, needs a lot of work still and, and certainly appreciate you taking the lead on hammering this home and know there's a lot of farmers behind you in this fight. And uh, we, we have a lot of customers that are involved and we're, we're going to be engaging them in calling their representatives and trying to make this happen. And, and by the way, let me disclose my, my own uh, personal interest in here. Somebody said, well, Congressman Massey, you're a beef farmer and you would benefit from this bill. And that's the only reason you're doing it. Look, I have 50 head of cattle. There are 50 million beef cattle in the United States. So I have one millionth of the U.S. herd. And so I could stand to benefit one millionth of the benefit of this bill. And that's before you consider the fact that I don't raise pork or lamb. And so, um, you know, I'm not doing this bill for myself. But as a congressman, I would like to also give your, uh, your viewers a little bit of insight into what's most effective when you talk to your congressman. Um, I would be brief. You're most likely going to get a staffer, and, but that's okay. They, they will carry the message to the member. Um, be brief. Be polite. Don't, d never cuss at them. And even if your livelihood is on the line, even if you're very passionate about it, just be matter of fact. Say, look, my livelihood depends on this, and it's very important to me, and I would really like for him. By the way, ask for a co-sponsorship. Don't ask him to vote for it, Okay. Because they'll tell you, this may never get a vote if I don't get enough co-sponsors. If they're on your side, don't let them say they're on your side without co-sponsoring this bill. Know what your ask is. And never, never say, I'll never vote for you again if you don't do this. Like, because once you play that card, the member of Congress has no need to talk to you again ever because he knows you're never going to vote for him again. So, yes. And it, yep. they also, if they're, if they're a good, if they're a good uh, statesman, they wouldn't respond to that anyway. I mean, they've got to balance the needs of 750,000 people. Every U.S. representative represents that many people. And so just, just be considerate, be polite, be short. And you can call back a week later, too. There's no law that says you can't call your congressman every week. I have people that call me every day. We call them frequent flyers. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wear out your welcome. But, you know, every one or two weeks is, is fine to see where they're at because they're going to tell you, well, I'll take a look at the bill. Call back a week or two later. Let you know what you find out there. Be persistent and be polite, and, and engage your friends to make the same phone calls. I believe a dozen phone calls in, into one member of Congress's office is enough to get them to co-sponsor this bill. Um, it doesn't take thousands. That should be easy enough for us to do. And and don't you know you can send an email, or if you've got great penmanship, you can sit down and write a really long letter. But I don't, even, I don't think those are as effective as a phone call, and a phone call is easier to do. That's good to know. Well, Congressman, I really appreciate you cutting out this time to, uh, to talk about it and give us some more details here. I um, you know there's a lot of support for this, especially in the um, you know, direct-to-retail, regenerative, sustainable community. Um, and a lot of people are paying attention to what you're doing and pulling for you, and uh, we're going to we're going to do what we can to try to make this happen because we're here on the front line, so to speak, of what's going on in the, uh, in the food industry, in the food world, and we see what needs to happen. And um, we appreciate having allies in D.C. that are actually listening to, to what we're saying. So thank you so much for coming out. Well, thanks, Jordan. I'm on your all, on your all side. I'm going to go back to my for farm and, and sort some steers and then move them into another paddock. So uh, that's what I'm going to do after we're done with this conversation. Thanks for getting the word out. This is great that we have these other means to get the word out. If people are watching this uh, and it's on Facebook or some other social media outlet, please share it or share a link to it because that's, that's how we go viral. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jordan. Bye-bye. So there you have it. I certainly uh, enjoyed the interview and thanks to the congressman for giving me the time to ask those questions. Um, I think it really can be summarized that there is no silver bullet solution right now, but we need to work towards building stronger, more resilient systems moving forward for the future for the next crisis that may come down the road. Um, to kind of wrap it up real quickly, what the Prime Act will do is allow custom and state inspected facilities to process animals, red meat, 
for farmers to sell by the piece through their farm store, farmer's market, what have you. This is really about the extent of what could happen at the federal level. There's a lot of questions out there about uh, poultry exemption, about health uh, officials at the county and state level. That's really not something that can be addressed from the federal level, from my understanding. And so that will take everyone being involved in those um, respective levels of inspection and regulation to have changes uh, happen there. So I hope you enjoyed the interview. I hope you learned something about it. Please share it through all of your networks. This is something that uh, if it's going to happen, it needs to happen very soon. And you know your uh, elected officials need to know what uh, what your thoughts are on it, that you support it. So um, as, as Congressman Massey said, call up your congressman, your two senators, and let them know that you are supporting this. And hopefully we can make this happen. Um, just a brief update on our farm here. Our sales have gone very well through this. We've had a lot more customers come in. Um, there's no animals out here at risk of being depopulated from overproduction. Um, we are doing very well, but I am burdened for the agricultural community at large. Um, and you know, I hope there's gonna be a lot of, stand almost blew over. I hope there's gonna be a lot of lessons learned through all this that we as a farming community can um, learn from, that we'll be stronger moving forward, and that we will take back a lot of the, um, let, let's just say a lot of the freedoms and rights that we should have as producers and have given away to either large corporations or to, to regulatory entities. So until next time, we'll catch you out there. Stay strong in your farm. Remember.